one are the behavioral issues. Now the right hand of the slide, that is the behavioral issues are something that we frequently encounter. They include the behavioral insomnia of childhood. Remember the first case that we have discussed, the first scenario, that is a behavioral insomnia of childhood. That is not a normal phenomena. It requires some amount of behavioral modification. It requires some amount of discussion with the sleep hygiene, with the positive and negative sleep associations, but it is primarily a behavioral disorder. On the other hand, the second half comprises of the medical part, which includes the obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement disorder, narcolepsy, parasomnias, all possible causes that might come into the purview of sleep. And shortly, I will give you an extensive list of what are the diseases that can be associated with pediatric sleep disorders. So again, is this a myth or a reality? Do you really feel that pediatric sleep disorder is something that needs to be talked about? Well, this is a recent article that is on prevalence, not very recent, but is a pioneering article on the prevalence of this diagnosed sleep disorders in pediatric primary care practices. What it essentially tells us is that about one to 3% of the children with some form of sleep complaints have obstructive sleep apnea, 5 to 27% have primary snoring, behavioral insomnia of childhood ranges from 20 to 30% of the infants and toddlers and up to 5% of the school-aged children. Primary or psycho psychophysiological insomnia range between 5 to 20%, parasomnia ranges between 5 to 35%, sleep-related movement disorder ranges between 2 to 8%. And if you consider that we talk so much about pediatric allergic disorders, either in isolation or in combination with asthma and allergy, yet the overall prevalence is somewhere around 20 to 30 percent, even in this part of the country. And from USA, we have got pediatric sleep disorder whose prevalence ranges between 5 to 25 percent, which means that it is almost as common as allergic disorders. So to understand that to start assessing sleep disorders in children, we follow this module, we follow this mnemonic of bears, which essentially talks about bedtime issues, excessive daytime sleepiness, awakening throughout the night, regular, regularity and duration of sleep, and sleep disorder breathing or snoring. We basically try to classify the problems of sleep in these five broad headings. And if we understand the problem is with bedtime issues, problem is with snoring or sleep disturbed breathing, problem is with the regularity and duration of sleep, the next one is that we elaborate on that through salient histories and clinical examinations. So then we need to delve into the chief sleep campaign, the additional sleep history, supplementary information, whatever that is necessary, additional medical history, daytime symptoms, a lot of sleep disorder actually present in the daytime. And what we understand that if a child who is not sleepy throughout the night is likely to have daytime somnolence. Unfortunately, in pediatric sleep disorder, children who do not have good sleep tend to remain irritable and aggressive throughout the day. So a child in the second case scenario, the child who is remaining aggressive and irritable of late is because the child is having sleep issues. And that makes them, there are you know, different hypotheses for that, but that makes them irritable and aggressive. And that is a setting where we need to delve deep into the history of sleep hygiene, the sleep log that we look into. And at times we ask for home record, video recording and we should not forget about medications and adolescents, though should not be mentioned, but we know it's a reality about caffeine and alcohol intake in the adolescent age group can also give rise to problems with sleep. So approach to sleep can be, and sleep disorders can be based into five broad surveys. One is difficulty in initiating the sleep. One is specific sleep disorders, One is excessive daytime sleepiness. One is sleep disorder breathing and movement disorders associated with sleep. The first one is basically behavioral insomnia of childhood and some other conditions. So difficulties initiating sleep, when we want to go deep into this, we need to look into the pre-sleep activities, what exactly the child is doing, 
the periods of exercise throughout the day in the morning hours in the evening hours vis a vis the sedentary lifestyle and the sedentary hours it has been seen there is a direct correlation with the number of hours of sleep and the ease of initiation of sleep and viewing of television or playing electronic games in the evening bedtime routine is very important in this scenario stimulating activities readily available for sleep environment we will talk about the positive and negative sleep association just trying to put things into perspective looking at the mobile looking at the television looking at the laptop just before falling into a sleep is actually a bad sleep association so our counseling starts of saying that the light should be off by about 9 pm child should not look into any of the multimedia devices at least one hour prior to going to the sleep there should be positive sleep associations so now it's positive sleep associations country to country varies we have a habit of sleeping together the parents and the children westerners have a habit of leaving the child in court after first year of life they associate staying with parent as a bad sleep association we do not consider that but even then what is a bad sleep association if a child falls into sleep uh, sleep in her mother's lap and wakes up at the midnight and again requires mother's lap for falling back into the sleep is a bad sleep association so there should not be any external factor that should be associated with the child sleep cycle and one of the better way to counteract that is to use a pashvarish they call it teddies we call it pashvarish the thing is same it is a comforting thing beside the child and if we can make the child have the habit of falling asleep clutching onto the beer clutching onto the pashvarish then whenever the child go gets up in the morning midnight he will or she will again fall asleep clutching onto the same thing and it is not required for the parents to be awake through, throughout the day so this is the good and bad sleep associations and the bedtime routines that we talk about next is what we were already discussing response to nighttime awakenings and here there is a role of the parents at times it has been seen parents especially in our part of the country are too much bothered about their kids sleep so if the child is awake the entire family including the grandparents are also awake and everybody is banging on the door ki holo kaatche keno okay to dry water da okay two words da so that is how we have all grown up and that is something that needs to be broken down so caregiver's response can promote or extinguish the behavior if the caregiver is calm and practices the good sleep hygiene and the positive sleep association then sleep becomes easier and then there are associated functions like dysfunctional family so psychological dysfunction anxiety and depression in children concomitant medical problems can all give rise to the behavioral insomnia of childhood which is characterized by difficulty in falling asleep second is excessive sleepiness throughout the day there are four different groups of disorders that can come into this one is a physiological thing because just simply because insufficient sleep most of our residents suffer, suffer from that delayed sleepwalk phase disorder because people go to the hostel people go to the go to their places people go to their home at 11 o'clock and then is hooked on to the internet facebook and all sorts of things so by that time the child the person the child the adolescent falls asleep it is already 4 o'clock in the morning and then there is a delayed sleep walk phase disorder because that person get needs to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning again so there is an effective reduction in the total sleep duration narcolepsy is a problem it is a disorder obstructive sleep apnea will deal subsequently and because again this is a something that is interesting that one should remember remember apart from osa and all other causes of daytime somnolence there is something called a central disorder of hypersomnolence some of you have actually done it in your mcq that is klein levin syndrome which is recurrent hypersomnia usually associated with menstrual disorders and idiopathic hypersomnia these are rare but yet they can come into the purview of excessive sleepiness throughout the day and the third and most interesting or important part is the sleep disordered breathing now all children whose snores are not pathological all children who have got respiratory sleep problem snore it is like in our childhood days shop khari kharok shop khar kharok noy so everybody who snores 
I'm not suffering from obstructive sleep apnea, but everybody who is suffering from obstructive sleep apnea snows. So 10 to 70%, 17% of the young children in the United States have reported snoring. And this is because now American Academy of Pediatrics made it mandatory to screen for OSA for all children. So sleep history is taken in all children. 50% of children referred for a PSG will be diagnosed with snoring for any indication. Snoring is due to a vibration of upper airway tissues during sleep, secondary to upper airway narrowing, and sleep-induced pharyngeal hypotonia results from increased upper airway resistance. Children who snore more than three times per night should be evaluated by their primary care physician or specialist to determine the need for polysomnography. Persistent comorbidities like hypertension, behavioral disturbances, and poor asthma control adds to probability or propensity of snoring. Now, the severe most form of obstructive, um, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is the obstructive sleep apnea. It is a common pediatric disorder, contrary to commoner belief that it is not common, it is actually very common, characterized by recurrent events of partial or complete upper airway obstruction during sleep, which result in abnormal ventilation and sleep pattern. So what is different between snoring and obstructive sleep apnea when snoring and obstruction because of the same physiology actually gives rise to altered respiratory behavior and altered movement behavior. We classify them as obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. It has got neurobehavioral cardiovascular de deficits, poor quality of life and increased healthcare utilization. So now I have prom promised you I'll give a lot of list of disorder. These are the common medical conditions that are associated with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. We are in ICH, the syndromic hospital of India, and you name a syndrome, I have it over here. Any syndrome that is associated with craniofacial anomalies is likely to suffer from obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Any syndrome which has got some neurological abnormality, particularly mechanical abnormalities, is likely to have obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. There are a hell lot of Miscellaneous causes as well, including even prematurity per se is a risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. In the third scenario of my three scenarios, what was so unique about that child about prader willi syndrome posted for growth hormone therapy? Can of any of the residents? So when growth hormone is actually started, it starts increase in growth of the adenoids and the lymphoid tissue around the throat, which increases the severity of obstetric sleep apnea syndrome. So therefore, anybody who is supposedly going for a growth hormone therapy should undergo a sleep study before going for a growth hormone therapy to identify the background of any sleep pathology. Right. So this is American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommendations on how to look into obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. We will discuss it subsequently. This is, they have basically classified into this into two parts, one with children who are apparently healthy and children who are apparently diseased. And then salient history and investigations, some ancillary tests as well. So we'll go straight away with the history. History tells us almost everything about whether a child is actually suffering from a sleep disorder. The most common disorders are daytime somnolence, irritability, aggressive behavior, and frequent awakenings at night and snoring. All children with OSA snore. Snoring has a low specificity for OSAs and clinical symptom alone cannot reliably distinguish OSAs from primary snoring. Paradoxical breathing is again seen in children who are suffering from OSA. Duration and frequency of these symptoms should be elicited as well as the degree of persistence. There are other issues like diaphoresis and enuresis in sleep. Daytime manifestations of OSAs in children differ from adults. Neurobehavioral sequelae like behavioral and neurocognitive sequelae is huge. There could be n number of things starting from poor scholastic performance, and then there could be so many other things down the line. Cognitive deficits, yes. comprehensive evaluation of sleep hygiene should be performed, including a discussion on the frequency of napping, 
टाइमिंग ऑफ स्लीप स्लीप एनवायरनमेंट लार्ज इवनिंग मील्स एंड लेट नाइट स्क्रीन यूज so specifically looking into the sleep there are certain things that we look into we look for mouth breathing and signs suggestive of mouth breathing we look for adenoid phases dysmorphic features suggestive of a genetic syndrome again i told you almost all of the genetic syndromes who have got some association with craniofacial abnormalities likely to have obstructive sleep apnea voice quality which could be hyponasal due to nasal obstruction or muffled secondary to tonsillar enlargement tonsil size is graded according to brodsky score please do remember tonsil size does not have correlation directly with the severity of the obstructive sleep apnea it is the clinical syndrome complex that gives you the guideline for what to do or what not to do then there is retronathia micronathia mid facial hypoplasia there could be presence of systemic hypertension on children who have got long standing obstructive sleep apnea there could be primary pulmonary hypertension as well growth should be evaluated as obesity is a risk factor and ch children who are frequently falling back on sleep are actually stunted so next is about polysomnography the sleep study that we all talk about the gold standard and uh, to assess the severity of osas that is obstructive sleep apnea in children with overnight polysomnography guidelines for polysomnography has been given by american academy of sleep medicine the parameters monitored are eeg ecg oxygen saturation intertidal carbon dioxide body position and movement then we'll look into the sleep staging and architecture and try to identify different types of apneas so levels of sleep study level 1 is the best one which is done in a hospital takes place in a sleep lab observed in real time by a sleep technologist level 1 study monitor includes brain wave ecg breathing activity limb movement and oxygen saturation for pediatric patients we also include carbon dioxide monitoring level 2 is something less than level 3 uh, level 1 level 3 is even something less than level 2 which is also called the home sleep testing and level 4 is often referred to as an overnight pulse oximetry testing which is something that most of us can actually afford if we are oriented about this and completed in the home level for study monitors are oxygen saturation and heart rate only so sleep study is set up this is just the overview we need 28 sensors 15 sensors on the head and face which six are eeg channels two eye lids three chin lids and four referencing channels one snore sensor two lid ecg two effort belts four leg sensor one pulse oximeter one tcco2 monitor one nasal cannula coronasal thermo sensor so this is the orientation of this international 1020 system of where to put the leads we are not going into the details of this these are the eeg channels and the eye and chin sensors it looks a little dramatic more than what we normally do in our eeg and then there are additional sensors like this are as well and after that we see the tracing and this looks like a, this so this is a one epoch of a polysomnograph what is an epoch an epoch is one screenshot so we are looking into about 1080 epochs in a complete sleep study it takes about 2 hours for one sleep study reporting every 30 epochs can be of 30 seconds 90 seconds 120 seconds every 30 second epoch is taken for sleep study and each epoch is then looked for sleep stage arousal respiratory movements respiratory events movements cardiac events review of audio video recording so sleep stages everybody knows from stage w that is wakefulness to stage 1 that is nrem 1 nrem 2 nrem 3 to rem so there are five sleep stages so for each epoch we will look into the sleep stage we will if there are two or feature suggestive of two or more stages are there we will take the better one that is most of the epoch consists of stage 1 then we will call it a nrem stage 1 most of the epoch consists of feature suggestive of stage 2 we will call it an nrem stage 2 then eeg frequencies i am sure everybody knows more than me the slow wave delta wave theta waves alpha waves and beta waves then we will also look into the respiratory events particularly we are actually looking for apnea hypopnea and we are trying to get a ratio that is called a apnea hypopnea index and based on this apnea hypopnea index we will classify sleep 
the obstructive sleep apnea as having mild, moderate, or severe. So there are different types of apnea. One is an obstructive apnea. One is a hypopnea, which is not exactly apnea, but not normal breathing as well. One is a central apnea, where the cause is not over here, but over there. What is the difference between obstructive apnea and a central apnea? In central apnea, the problem is with ventilation. So you will not see movements of respiratory muscles as well. So everything will be flat. Whereas in obstructive sleep apnea, in response to the hypoxia that is happening, there will be increase in movements. So that differentiate between what is obstructive sleep apnea and what is a central apnea. So everything is flat is a central apnea. And mixed apnea is when obstructive apnea or hypopnea is together with some components of central apnea. And then we will also look into the cardiac events. I have not included that. We will also look into the limb movement because sleep disorder also encompasses abnormal movements during the sleep. There is a definite entity called periodic limb movements for which there are certain guidelines. Until and unless we get a little familiar with the sleep study, looking into the guidelines or looking into the criteria does not really carry a message. What I am willing to touch over here is that what are the different aspects of a sleep study when we do a sleep study? And then diagnostic criteria after going through all this, we were discussing about obstructive sleep apnea. Let us now understand how do we diagnose. We diagnose obstructive sleep apnea based on few Clinical criteria in presence of snoring, labored, paradoxical, or obstructed breathing, sleepiness, hyperactivity, behavioral problems, or learning problems, plus polysomnography demonstrating one or more of the following. So one or more of obstructive or mixed apneas or obstructive hypopneas per hour of sleep, a pattern of hypoventilation, which is obstructive, defined as at least 25% of total sleep time with hypercapnia, that is ETCO2 more than 50, actually comprises of the diagnostic criteria. So you need to have your clinical criteria, you need to have your PSG, that is polysomnograph criteria, to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea. And then for all practical purposes, there are only two therapy of obstructive sleep apnea. One is adrenaline and tonsillectomy, and one is non-invasive ventilation. When and where to go for which one depends upon the severity of the disease. I have not included that in my presentation, just giving an overview. So in a mild case, the first option is always surgery. For a child who is already diseased, the child who is having a severe form of obstructive sleep apnea, there is a case of giving NIV, prior to making the patient fit for surgery. There are certain cases where surgery is not absolutely possible. In such situations, home NIV is the treatment or un answers to these questions. And last but not the least, some amount of drama to end my presentation. So parasomnias is the specific sleep disorders that we have talked about in our fourth heading. It could be sleep-wake transition parasomnias, hypno hypnic starts, Benign neonatal sleep myoclonus, isolated sleep paralysis, rhythmic movement disorders. Basically, this first group is classically described in our villages as Bhute Pawa. So all forms of adbhut adbhut behavior while falling asleep or while coming off sleep are actually parasomnias. Then comes the arousal parasomnias. Horhoa, which is confusional arousal, sleep terror, and sleep walking. And Shopno Deke Kannakati Kora, which are the nightmares, REM sleep behavior disorder, and catarrhenia. What is catarrhenia? This is an interesting term. This refers to groaning in sleep. So at times, some of the parents come to us and say that the child is groaning. There is a peculiar sound that is coming out when a child is sleeping. We frequently take them as snoring, but not all of them are snoring. Remember, primary snoring is not, a, not an indication of polysomnography, but any of these parasomnias are actually an indication of polysomnography. Something for the PGs again, three forms of arousal parasomnia. Is one is confusional arousal. The first one is confusional arousal. Second one is nightmare. 
third one is sleep walking so age of onset is different frequency is almost same for most of these children peak time of occurrence for confusional arousal is in the first third of the night sleep typically the child are whimpering some articulation sitting up in bed are, are inconsolable for nightmares first uh, third of the night sleep screaming agitation flushed face sweating inconsolable first third of again the first third of the night sleep because these are confusional states are associated with arousals so they are likely to occur in the second stages of NREM sleep NREM2 or in case of nightmares or night who are sleepwalking in the REM part of the sleep so in, a, in every sleep cycle it would be either in the first third or in the last few minutes of the sleep not in the N3 that is the deepest form of the sleep or for the matter even N2 as well so that brings me to end of today's presentation this is me getting the certificate of diploma in pediatric sleep medicine with the person sitting to my standing to my right kr bharat reddy from bangalore who is actually pioneer in india about pediatric sleep medicine together with eileen kinmi and few of my friends who together we are actually trying to create a milieu of recognizing pediatric sleep disorder as an entity in pediatric population not only in the western world but also over here thank you